Well, good morning, and welcome to Worthington Christian Church. We want to welcome you to our online campus. We are so glad that you're here today. Wherever you find yourself this morning, hopefully it's in the comfort of your own living room or a place that you feel very comfortable. Our prayer is that you're healthy and that you're safe. Today, we are going to follow Jesus together. We've already had time of worship where we just simply thank God for his faithfulness to us, primarily through the life and faith that we have in Jesus. We've had time where we have remembered the sacrifice of Jesus together. And today, we're going to dig in the Word of God together in a series that we're calling Resurrected. If you have a Bible with you this morning, let's turn to Luke chapter 24, and we'll begin in verse 36. Now, we started a series a couple weeks ago called Resurrected. We started this on Easter Sunday, where, of course, we looked at the resurrection of Jesus. But what happens after Jesus' resurrection? What are the events that prove that Jesus really did defeat the curse of sin, which is death? Well, we find those, many of those moments, in Luke chapter 24. Now, last week, we talked about uh, two followers of Jesus that that take a a short hike to the town of, of Emmaus. They go from Jerusalem and hike seven miles to a town of Emmaus after Jesus' supposed resurrection. Now, they don't know what to think. They are followers of Jesus, so they believed that he was the Son of God, and they didn't know what to make of his ministry and his teachings, because when he dies on the cross, they thought that he was the Messiah, that he was the Savior. But now there's this, there's this little rumor that Jesus is no longer in his tomb. So one of two things have happened in the mind of these two followers on the road to Emmaus. One, Jesus has actually defeated death, which would blow their mind. Or two, the more logical explanation is because Jesus was so popular, somebody stole his body. While these two men are hiking to Emmaus, seven miles, this unidentified man shows up. Well, we know because we know the scriptures that it is Jesus. They do not recognize him as Jesus. They hike the seven miles. They go into their home. They invite Jesus into their home. And it's at that moment that Jesus takes bread and he breaks the bread and he gives it to them, showing his blessing. And it's at that moment that they recognize Jesus. Then Jesus is taken from their presence and they decide to walk, hike, probably sprint the seven miles back to Jerusalem to tell the 11 disciples and the other followers of Jesus that they have indeed seen the resurrected Jesus. Only to come to find out that Simon Peter one of Jesus' disciples, has also encountered the resurrected Jesus. This is the scene that we find ourselves in in Luke chapter 24, verse 36. You know, here's the interesting thing. We, we now have three unique moments in Luke chapter 24 where we have encountered the resurrection of Jesus. One is when Mary Magdalene and the other women, they go to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning only to see that the stone has been rolled away And that the angels announce that Jesus is is not here. He's risen. He's defeated the curse of sin. He's defeated death. Well, these ladies go and they go back and they report this, telling the disciples. That's the first moment. The second moment is the incognito Jesus showing up on the road to Emmaus. But then he reveals himself to these two followers in their home. These followers go back to Jerusalem from Emmaus and they tell the disciples And then, of course, we have the third, where Simon Peter reports that he's seen the resurrected Jesus. Well, the very next moment of Jesus showing himself as defeating death happens in our scripture today. Let's turn. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 36. Let's learn from the word of God today. It says, while they were still talking about these things, so about the appearance to the road to Emmaus, While they're still talking about these things, also appearance to uh, Simon Peter, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. So Jesus shows up in the middle of their time together and says, hey, what's up? How's everybody doing? He says, peace be with you. Shalom. Verse 37. Huh. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. You know, I think sometimes when we read about the followers of Jesus in the Gospels, Sometimes we're a little hard on them. You know, it seems like every other chapter, the followers of Jesus in the Gospels are are either scared, either lack faith, you know, ask stupid questions. 
that don't, don't quite know what to really think or make of Jesus in the Gospels. And, and it's very easy to look at, at the settings in the Gospels with the followers of Jesus and think, well, what, what are these people doing? Why don't they get it? I think sometimes we're a bit too hard on them. You know, they're, they're talking among themselves here in this setting in Luke chapter 24. And Simon Peter's saying, hey, I've seen Jesus. I've seen the resurrected Jesus. And these two followers of Jesus that have come back to Emmaus, they say, hey, we saw Jesus. He broke bread, bread with us. And then all of a sudden Jesus shows up and it says that they're startled and terrified like they saw a ghost. Well, let me ask you something. Do, do you believe in Jesus? Do, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sin, my sin, all sin? Do we believe that Jesus defeated death by the power of God's Spirit that rose him from the dead, that he defeated death so that death could have no hold over us? He didn't defeat death for his own purpose. He defeated death for, for us. Do you believe these things to be true? Well, if the answer to that question is yes, then welcome to following Jesus. Now, this is where it starts. It's, it's not necessarily where it ends, but that's certainly where it starts. You now have faith that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, here's the thing. We believe these things to be true. And in Luke chapter 24, we are further along than the disciples were at this point. Now, they believed that Jesus was the Son of God, but they also didn't think that the Son of God could be crucified. And they also didn't think that the Son of God could die and be laid in a tomb. And they also didn't think that the Son of God could potentially completely defeat death, even though they had seen the miracles of Jesus, all the miracles of Jesus, and they've even seen Jesus defeat death for other people. So if we believe these things to be true, we're a little bit further along. So we can't be that hard on the disciples when they are startled in fear because the resurrected Jesus shows up to them. You know, it, it would be like this. Imagine if, if Jesus, if Jesus just showed up right here, right next to me on this live stream. I mean, I'm sitting here preaching away. I'm just, I'm just having at it. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up right here. What, what would you do? More importantly, what would I do? I mean, that would freak us out. It would, of course, we would be startled. We'd be frightened. Now, here's the thing. I wouldn't know whether I should run off the stage and run out of the church building or if I should give Jesus a hug. And you wouldn't know whether you should turn off your device or your TV right now because this is just too much for you. Even more, what, what, if, what if Jesus showed up in your living room right now. I mean like the physical Jesus showed up in your living room. You'd spit your coffee out of your mouth, wouldn't you? Yeah, we would be terrified. So we can't be too hard on the followers of Jesus for, for being so terrified. But look at what Jesus says to them in verse 38. Jesus said to them, why, why are you troubled? Why, why are you so scared? I mean, it's me. It's Jesus. I'm the son of God. I love you like no other. And why do doubts rise in your mind? Now that, my friend, is an interesting question. Why, why do doubts rise in our mind? Why, why do we have doubts? You ever think about this? You see, here's the thing. Doubts and fears are, are different. They're not brother and sister. They're more like cousins. They have differences. And here's what I believe to be the major difference between a doubt and a fear. A fear is rational. It's rational. Even fears that seem to be irrational, when we stop and think about it, they are rational because the root of our fear comes out of our experiences. We have experienced something that often makes us afraid of, of some other experiences in life. For instance, let's, let's say that you're a hypochondriac, meaning that, that you fear getting sick. <laughs> well, first of all, this probably has to be a very difficult time for you. But stop and think about that fear. That fear is very rational. Why? Be, because people get sick all the time. All the time people get sick. Well, let's take another fear, for instance. Let's take uh, arachnophobia. 
You know, we all know what arachnophobia is because there was a terrible movie that came out in the 90s that tried to make us afraid of spiders. But many people are afraid of spider. That's, that's arachnophobia. Think about this. It's not irrational to be afraid of something that can kill you, that can potentially kill you. Fear is irrational. But doubts? Where, where do doubts come from? I mean, doubts just have a way of, exactly as Jesus said it, of rising in our mind. They, they seem to come from nowhere, and they greatly affect how we live our lives. Perhaps you, you doubt that, that everything's going to be okay. Perhaps you doubt that in the midst of this pandemic, that this pandemic could become an epidemic, and you doubt that it really is going to be okay. Perhaps you doubt that, that everything's going to work out for you. Perhaps you doubt the love of God. Perhaps you doubt that God loves you. You see, doubts and fears are different. The root of fear is our experience. It's an experience that has caused us to be afraid. But our doubts, the root of our doubt is a lack of trust. We doubt because we don't trust. We don't trust. We doubt that everything is going to work out for us or we doubt that everything's going to be okay because we lack trust. And as a follower of Jesus, when we have doubts, we doubt the promises of God. One of my favorite promises in all the Bible is Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I would encourage you to memorize this scripture. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 8, I believe the second most powerful chapter in the entire Bible. He reminds us of this. He says, and we know that in all things, not just some things, not just a few things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him. You talk about a promise to hold on to. Do you love God? Now, I didn't ask if you love God perfectly because not a single one of us does. There's one person that's ever walked the face of this planet that has loved God perfectly. His name is Jesus, and you're not him, nor am I. Do you love God? Okay. Then things are going to work out. The Word of God tells us that. You know, it's interesting. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 18, we were told this. Perfect love drives out fear. Now remember, fear and doubt, they're a little bit different. They're not brother and sister, they're just cousins. Perfect love drives out fear. You know what drives out doubt? You know what drives the doubts that fill our mind? You know what drive those doubts out? It's trust. So let me encourage you to do something. Next time you start to feel, you start to think of a doubt that's coming into your mind. You know that when this happens, you, you have a thought that comes in your mind and, and you say, okay, maybe this isn't all gonna work out. Well, you think that first, then our thoughts lead to our feelings, and then feelings of anxiety, feelings of worry, feel, feelings of, of, of kind of being uneasy, they fill us up. Next time that happens, I want to encourage you to do something. I want you to audibly say out loud, no, no, I choose to trust Jesus with this doubt. I choose to trust Jesus and I, I encourage you to out loud quote, quote Romans chapter 8, verse 28. No, no, no. No, no, no. I love God. I don't love him perfectly. And the truth of God's word says that all things will work for my good because I'm in a relationship with the almighty God through faith in Jesus. Take it a stride. We doubt because we lack trust. And Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? Why are you troubled? And why did doubts rise in your mind? Look at verse 39. It goes on to say, Jesus says to them in the midst of their conversation, he says, okay, look at my hands and my feet. It's me. It's me. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So Jesus knows their thoughts. He knows that they're doubting. Okay, is he real? Is he not real? Is he a ghost? What's going on here? Go ahead and go to verse 40. It says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Could you imagine what that looked like? The hands 
in the feet of Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, that were nailed to the cross. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, he shows them to his disciples, to his followers, and he even says, you can touch me. It's me. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bone. Look at this. This blows my mind. And while they still did not believe, and while they still did not believe because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? Verse 42. They gave him a piece of broiled fish. Now, this is how we know Jesus is a healthy cat, because he eats broiled fish. Now, if I had been dead for three days and I hadn't had anything to eat, I'd be like, hey, you got any fish and chips? I would have went fried fish. But he goes broiled fish. He's a healthy eater. He says he took it and he ate it in their presence. Now, there are many, many, many reasons we love Jesus. But, but I'm thinking of one reason in particular of, of why I love Jesus. One of the reasons I love Jesus is because Jesus is so patient. He's so kind. And he is so gentle in my moments of, of unbelief. In my moments of stupidity. You know, the disciples. These are the disciples These are people that have spent the last three years with Jesus. They've seen Jesus do all kinds of things to prove he's the son of God. But when they see him defeat death, even though he's in their presence, he's shown himself to them. He's talked to them. He's allowed them to to touch him. He eats in front of them to show that he is fully alive. Jesus does not condemn them for their lack of faith. He doesn't contend them that it, that it takes them a while to, to really grasp the concept that he's defeated death. Not for his sake, but for their sake. So that death could have no hold of us. That death could have no victory over us. Here's one of the reasons I love Jesus so much. It's because Jesus allows us to journey towards him. You see, our relationship with Jesus is a journey. It's not a destination. It's not to get to a place where we've arrived and have it all figured out. No, it's a journey that Jesus is going to walk this journey with us. You know, perhaps you're not for sure what you believe to be true about Jesus. You know, perhaps you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, I, I get that Jesus could be the Son of God. I, I get that, that Jesus died on the cross. That's a historical fact. That's not faith. The faith comes in where it means he died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sin, your sin, all sin. And I kind of, I'm, I'm starting to grasp the, com, the, the complex reality that, that because he was the Son of God, he could defeat death once and for all. But I'm not quite sure what, what I believe to be true about Jesus. Can I encourage you this morning? That's okay. That's okay for a while. It's okay to journey towards Jesus. We see it all the time in the Gospels. People journeying towards Jesus. I have a really good friend that, that sent me a text about a week and a half ago. It was a simple text. It was early one Thursday morning. I was actually working on a sermon on a computer. Had my cell phone right next to me. And I, and I get this text from a friend. And all the text said is, <laughs> all the text said was, hey, are, are you all still doing private baptisms during all this craziness? I about fell out of my chair when I got this text from my friend. You see, about a, a year ago, my friend, let's just say his name is Jeff, and that his wife's name is Noel, because that's exactly what their names are. About a year ago, Jeff and Noel, their daughter went to Round Lake Camp. She went to summer camp, and their daughter decided that, that she believed that Jesus was the Son of God, and that by her own choice, she wanted to give her life over to Jesus and to be baptized. And so Jeff and Noel, about a year ago, they invite me over to their house to talk to their daughter about what it means to give, their life to, to give her life to Christ and to be baptized. And so we sit down for, for a few minutes, and, and we talk to their daughter. But I'm friends with Jeff, and I know that Jeff 
Jeff doesn't know what he believes to be true about Jesus. And so we talk to their daughter for a few minutes, make sure she understands the decision that she's going to make. And then she says, okay, I'm good. I said, great. I look at the parents. I say, you know, when she's ready, we're ready. Just, just let us know. It'd be great. It'd be a great day for her. It'd be a great day for the family. But I knew that Jeff wasn't quite for sure what he believed to be true about Jesus. So I just started in on Jeff. I said, Jeff, what do you believe to be true about Jesus? I said, this is who Jesus is, this is who he was, this is what it means to follow Jesus. This is the reason why your wife, Noel, gave her life to Jesus five years ago, and she was baptized into her own faith. And I just sat there, and I poured it out to Jeff, my buddy Jeff. I poured it all out. And then I looked at Jeff, and I said, Jeff, what, what do you think of all this? What, what, do you, what do you think about Jesus? And I kid you not, my friend Jeff looked me dead in the eye, dead in the eye. He was as serious as a heart attack, and he said, Jay, I'm good. I said, Jeff, what do you mean? He said, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good where I'm at. Thanks, but no thanks. I said, okay. And I literally saw his wife, Noel, when we sat on their back patio, I saw her sink in her chair. She looked defeated. And then Jeff, I'm friends with him, so he's allowed to say particular things. But then my friend Jeff looked at me. He said, hey, Jay, no offense, but I, I don't get anything out of church. And then I sulked in my chair and felt defeated. I didn't say this, but I, I so wanted to say, Jeff, hey, hey, I know we're friends, but just because you say no offense doesn't mean you just get to say whatever you want to say. I'm the preacher. If you don't get anything out of church, that's on me, man. I just sat there and I tried to listen to Jeff, but he didn't have anything else to say other than I'm good. Okay, fast forward about a year, about a month ago, my wife Addie and I are having dinner with Jeff and Noel's lifelong friends. And they decide to ask me how I felt Jeff was doing in his journey towards Jesus. And I tell them this story. I said, well, according to Jeff, he's good. And so I don't know really where he's at, but I would say this. He's not very close, that's for sure. And then now they look discouraged. And so I didn't want them to be discouraged. I wanted to be the person of faith. And I said, well, you know, I don't know what Jeff will ever conclude to be true about Jesus. But I do know this. Jesus will pursue Jeff until his last breath. Last Thursday, I get this text from my buddy Jeff. Hey, y'all still doing private baptisms during all this craziness? I text back, yep. And he texts me back one simple word. I said, what are you thinking? And he texts back, me. 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 I immediately called him. And he told me how he had had a change of heart. And we, we came into the church together, and we practiced a social distance baptism. I want to show it to you. Go ahead. Take a look at this. So I ask that you would repeat this confession. I stating, I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Almighty God. The Son of the Almighty God. And I choose. And I choose. To follow him. To follow him. Jeff Lagos, because of your confession of faith. Um, because God bless you with an awesome wife and an awesome family and some awesome friends. You're not going to baptize yourself <laughs> with the authority of Jesus, with the authority of his word, and I guess the authority of me social distancing in this baptistry with you for the forgiveness of your sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit that's told to us in the fifth book of the New Testament, the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 38. Have fun, man. Now, how incredible is that? How incredible is that? I kid you not, two weeks, two weeks before that moment, two weeks before I, I was walking in Jeff's neighborhood, one of our elders, Keith Fields, one of our overseers of our church, he lives in Jeff's neighborhood. And so Keith Fields and I were taking this social distance walk, just catching up, and we walked right past Jeff's house. And I told Keith all about Jeff's story. I said, this is the only guy that I can remember that I've told everything I know about Jesus too. And he looked at me and he says, I'm good. I'm good. Here's the point. It's okay to journey towards Jesus. 
It's okay to journey towards Jesus. That's exactly what the disciples were doing here at the end of Luke chapter 24. They were journeying. They were starting to understand who Jesus really was. Let's see how the event concludes. Verse 44, Jesus said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Verse 45, then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Exactly what has happened. And repentance, which means turning towards God, my man Jeff, not walking away from God. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Even to people like my buddy Jeff that say I'm good. Beginning first at Jerusalem. And then look at what happens. Jesus says, you are witnesses of these things. The root word of this, this word witness is martus. And martus is the root word for another word, martyr. Jesus tells his disciples that in one way, shape, or form, they will give their life for the gospel. Go to the last verse, verse 49. He says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. That's the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, my Father is going to send the Holy Spirit upon you. So go. Wait for it and then go. And you're going to preach the good news. Let me ask you the question this morning. Uh, are you good? You good? Are you sure? Are you sure? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of the Almighty God? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sin, of my sin, of all sin. Now here's a big one. Do you believe that Jesus physically walked out of his own tomb and defeated the curse of sin, which is death, once and for all? Not for his sake, but for our sake, that we may be with him for all eternity. Not because of what we have done, but what he has done for us. Do you believe this to be true about Jesus? Then let me encourage you. Perhaps it's time for you to take your next step in faith. Perhaps it's time for you to practice a social distance baptism. Here's what we'd like to do. We'd like to extend an invitation. If you're ready to take your next step in faith and to be baptized into faith, we're going to ask that you email, call us, or just simply hit the request prayer tab on our live site right now and say, I would like to know how I can practice a social distance baptism. We have no idea when this quarantine thing is going to lift, but we do have a way to practice a safe and socially distanced baptism so that people can have the opportunity to give their life to Christ, to take their next step, and to journey with Jesus. Perhaps you have a decision to make. Let me pray for us. Lord, may your spirit move. Now we know that Luke 24, at the end of Luke 24, when you promise your followers that your spirit, that power from on high is going to come, that's your Holy Spirit, that that was a historical moment. That's recorded for us in Acts chapter 1. But today we know that your spirit is present. We know that your spirit is not just contained in this building, on this church stage, but your spirit is in people's living rooms, it's on their devices, wherever they are. Because your spirit is not with us, it's in us. It's in us. So Lord, we pray a very bold prayer in this time. That your spirit would move in a way that would lead people to take their next step in their faith journey with you. They'd be like my buddy Jeff, a man in his word that said to God, God, if you show me the other side, I'm yours. And he kept his word because we believe in your promises. We believe in your promises. Give us trust and we thank you for what you have done for us. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.